Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dante Fortson here with part two of Nephilim Giants. This one is going to be called Bigfoot, Cavemen, and Medusa. I know the title might sound crazy, but we're going to get into a lot of stuff you probably never talked about among other believers before. So if you guys are not interested in the supernatural and really diving into history and seeing what's going on in the Bible and outside of the Bible, then this may not be the study for you. But if it is, make sure you stick around because we're going to get into some some kind of interesting stuff today. Now, if you would like a free book, all you have to do is go to blackhistoryinthebible.com. That's blackhistoryinthebible.com and enter your email address. Check your email. That's important. Click the confirmation link in the email, then click the download link and enjoy. You will get a PDF copy of pre-slavery Christianity. All you have to do is enter your email address at blackhistoryinthebible.com. For those of you who want to support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dante Fortson. Uh, you can support via cash app at cash tag BHITB. You can support via PayPal. The link is in the description. And of course, you can support in the super chat at any time by clicking the dollar sign and posting what you want to post. So if you do not have it to support financially, a share and a prayer are always appreciated. So today's study is going to be brought to you by As the Days of Noah Were, The Sons of God and the Coming Apocalypse. This book covers the days of Noah. It's very self-explanatory titles, exactly what it talks about, the days of Noah, the sons of God. It gets into the Nephilim and a lot of the supernatural stuff we're going to talk about here today. The second book is Beyond Flesh and Blood, The Ultimate Guide to Angels and Demons. That is more specific to angels and demons, and it gets into some of the stuff we're going to talk about here today. So let me start off with a verse. Through desire, a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Proverbs 18, 1. When I was younger and read that, that kind of inspired me to kind of step away from uh, a lot of the traditional teaching. And right around that time is when I ran into a bunch of Chuck Missler audio through Firefighters for Christ. And he was the first uh, Christian pastor that I ever heard talk about. Uh, the supernatural in context to events outside of the Bible, in context to the gods of mythology and in context in, in context to alien abduction in the modern time. So this kind of inspired me to really go outside and start looking at other stuff. And then along with this verse, it, the two together, you know, ultimately led to what you guys hear on this channel. So before I continue, I did have a couple of questions that people had and some of you guys um, asked some really good questions. And I didn't approve all the questions because some of you guys post links to, let me just say this like this. If you're going to ask a question, do not include a bunch of links to a bunch of different doctrine. I don't like to push or promote false doctrine on my channel. So I'm not going to approve uh, links to stuff that I consider to be crazy or false doctrine. So if you want to make a comment or a question, and you want it posted and answered by me personally, don't add those links in the description or I mean in your question. And number two, don't spam with links. Some of you guys, a couple, not even not even some, just a couple, a few, maybe two, three. I don't know. Probably about two of you guys do this a lot. And I never approve any of your comments, even though they're really good comments. You put a long list of videos. And I'm talking about 10 plus videos, links to 10 plus videos in every single comment. And it's the same links in every single comment. And you guys go post on a bunch of the comments. You're basically just spamming the comment section. So I'm not going to approve those. But anyway, I'm off of that rant. Dinosaurs and dragons. A couple people have brought them up. I'm going to talk about dinosaurs and dragons in a separate study. I think they deserve a study all on their own. But I personally believe what we see as dinosaurs are leftover remnants of the time of Noah. Um, evidence of all flesh being corrupt. And the reason I say this is because I'll give you a real quick. I'm going to dedicate like maybe two minutes to dinosaurs real quick. So I Googled what are dinosaurs. Uh, the Natural History Museum has this definition. A brief introduction to dinosaurs reveals a key feature that gave them an advantage over other prehistoric reptiles. So dinosaurs are called reptiles. Dinosaurs are a group of reptiles that dominated the land for over 140 million years, more than 160 million years in some parts of the world. They evolved diverse shapes and sizes from the fearsome giant Spinosaurus to the chicken sized micro, micro raptor and were able to survive in a variety of ecosystems. All right, so that's just a, a quick definition 
uh, directly from the Natural History Museum. Now this, hold on, let me go back. This was written, first published in 2012, and this is updated uh, June 2018. So this was first published in 20, 2012. This is the definition, right? So I want to show you guys right here. This is January 20th. This is uh, 2020. See, two days ago from when I had snapshot it. So I took this on the, the 22nd. Or maybe I took this on the 20th and it was on the 18th. So, yeah. Um, anyway, point is, <laughs> recently, a couple days ago, they found a fossil of a dinosaur with feathers and face filled with sharp teeth shows how they grew differently from other birds. But wait a minute. In 2012, didn't they say they were reptiles? Now they're birds. So, anyway... I'm going to get deeper into dinosaurs and dragons and stuff like that in a whole separate study. Uh, dinosaurs appear to be a hybrid between um, birds and lizards, neither of which are very big unless you count a crocodile. And even then, they don't get as big as some of the fossils we saw. Uh, and I believe that as the Bible tells us, all flesh had become corrupted and they probably started tampering with a lot of different animals, just like the uh, Book of Jubilees and the Book of Jasher indicate. So anyway, we'll get into that when we get to dinosaurs and reptiles. So let's talk about the watchers in mythology. I touched on the watchers last time I gave you guys the the foundation. So now we're going to step out and really start building on that foundation. And I find it to be a position of ignorance when people say we shouldn't look outside the Bible for historical context. It, 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 to me, it never made sense because the people who wrote this stuff lived during these times or they live closer to the times that they're talking about. So they understood the context of history. They understood what words to use so that the people at that time would understand what was being talked about. And many of them had no idea that any of the world would change the way it has. So to say that we don't need to go back and understand what they understood at the time of this writing to me is ignorance. And I say that in a way of not the same as stupid, but ignorance as in purposely not knowing something, not gaining information that could be to your benefit. And so to me, the idea that we need to not read any other books outside the Bible is ignorance because a lot of people go to school and they read books outside of the Bible all the time. And yet when we talk about the time frame the Bible is in, suddenly they don't want to read anything that has to do with anything in that time period. And it makes no sense. And I feel like a lot of people miss out on a lot of wisdom and information. So there's my rant on that. So the watchers in mythology. We're going to get into the IGG. I believe that's how you pronounce it. I have no clue. This is a Sumerian word. Um, I'll call them the IGG. And we're going to get into them when we do the study on angels. But as you see, angels keep popping up throughout this study on the Nephilim because you can't help to talk about the Nephilim if you don't speak about the angels. So the IGG in a real brief rundown were subservient to the uh, Sumerian Anunnaki who I believe to be a, a different rank of angels. We see the, in the Bible, they have ranks of angels. I believe these are two orders of angels based on the story. Now, the IgG were not as strong as the Anunnaki, who were older gods, lowercase g, and they put the IgG under servitude. Now, what's interesting about the IgG is that they rebel against the Anunnaki, but the Anunnaki also uh, rebel against the creator and they, they have a leader named Marduk or Marduk who is associated with the serpent. We'll get into all that later when we do the angel study. Now, the IGG have an interesting interpretation of their name. This is why they come up in this study because they are, again, Sumerian gods with a lowercase g. Another option is to try to interpret the words themselves. IG means I in the Sumerian language and it is used as a logogram in the Akkadian language. G stands for penetrate sexually. Therefore, IGG could be translated to eyes in the sky, the watchers who deflower. This is from the Wikipedia. So if you want to um, pull this source up, just go to Wikipedia, type in IG, IGI. That's it. It's only two letters. IG, IGI. If you remember the word, the letters I and G, you guys will never forget that. IG, IGI. So who did we say came down before the Watchers, the Grigori? I didn't mention the Grigori uh, last time, but that is the name of the Watchers in the Book of Enoch. The Watchers, the Grigori came down. 200 of them made a pact to come down and sleep with the women. They took wives of all who they chose. And here, when we look in the Sumerian, we find a group of lowercase g gods that their name literally means the Watchers who deflower. 
So it's very likely that they are the same group of beings that we saw in the book of Genesis and the book of Jubilees and the book of Jasher and the book of Enoch. And how were they depicted? See, if again, if this stuff is truth and it's it should be consistent. And we see if we look at this, this is how the IgG were depicted. They had four wings and they look like what many people believe to be angels. Even though we see a lot of angels with two wings in European um, paintings, when you get into the ancient paintings, the, the angels mostly had multiple wings. There are an ex there's an exception, but we're going to come back to the exceptions later. So just to give you guys an indication that there is stuff outside of the Bible that points back to the events that happened in the Bible. And we get a good indication that people saw what was going on. These aren't just myths. Nobody's painting the sons of Seth or the daughters of Cain. They are painting angels and naming the G lowercase G gods um, after beings in the Bible, the watchers who deflower. So we'll move on. So another thing we find outside of the Bible is the Sumerian Kings list. Now, the Sumerian Kings list is important because it is one of the few documents that documents um, what was going on pre-flood or antediluvian. And they kept a list of what they call the antediluvian rulers or the pre-flood rulers. Now, in this list, you will find some names that are unfamiliar. But then there is one name. And I checked into uh, these names. As you can see, uh, you can actually see what's purple and what's blue, what I've clicked. I found something interesting, too. Like if you don't click some of the links to get to Wikipedia and you go there another way, sometimes they're not lit up on Wikipedia showing that you clicked them. So because of some of these, I know for a fact I've clicked all of these uh, right here. Everything in this area I've clicked in red. So and even though it's not showing that I click some of them, but. The point being is in this Sumerians Kings list, you come across Demuzid, the shepherd. Now it's different from Demuzid, the, fi the fisherman, which comes later, but Demuzid, the shepherd, the name catches your attention. If you know what you're looking for, if you don't know what you're looking for, it won't mean anything until you click it and start reading and then you'll recognize some of the stuff. But Demuzid, the shepherd, uh, now let me point this out real quick. I don't agree with, the translation of the number of years that these people ruled. Now, there may be translational uh, number differences. They may be off by a couple of zeros, such as instead of 28,800 years, it may be 288 years or 360 years because the, the time frames of life uh, match up to the Bible when you drop a couple of zeros. So I think there was a problem in translation translation. So you have 288 here and 360 here. Um, but anyway, you guys get the point. Now, the reason Demuzid the shepherd is important is because Demuzid the shepherd is not a human. If you are familiar with mythology, you know that Demuzid the shepherd is a god, lowercase g, or in my opinion, of fallen angels. Now, let me put this out here before I continue. Once again, I've said this before. I believe that the gods of mythology, lowercase g, are the fallen angels doing stuff that they're not supposed to be doing. Think about the Matrix movie line. Uh, I think it was in the Matrix 2. Every time you hear about, uh, what is it, aliens and angels and gods, it's a program doing something it's not supposed to be doing. So in the like respect, I believe that the gods, lowercase g, are angels doing something they're not supposed to be doing. So every time we encounter gods in other mythologies, not, not idols, but gods, lowercase g, I believe that they're angels. And same thing with modern day uh, UFO abductions. Aliens, I believe, are fallen angels and i will get deeper into that when we get into the um to the angels and uh, the angelology and demonology uh series but i just want to make those beliefs clear once again i believe the gods lowercase g are angels and i believe the aliens of modern time are are angels so now demuza the shepherd is a lowercase g god aka an angel and when you read the story if you know the story you know he's tamas and for those of you who think you are familiar with the name Tammuz, and you're like, I think I heard that name somewhere before. You probably have if you read the book of Ezekiel. He said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. That's in Ezekiel 13, Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 13 to 14. So now if you understand the story you know that Tammuz is Demuzid, and he's listed among the Sumerians king list as a pre-flood ruler, but you also know he's a lowercase g god. So 
Tammuz is married to Inanna. We'll come back to Inanna later. But Tammuz is married to Inanna, and Inanna gets dragged off to hell to be basically tried by the Anunnaki, the uh, a higher rank of angels. Uh, I just mentioned them. Again, I'm not going to get sidetracked with the Anunnaki. But she gets free from hell. So it seems like she's not actually captured based on the story, but more so she's being interrogated by a group of beings. And then when she comes back, what is Tamas doing? Tamas is basically not caring that where she's at. He didn't care that she was gone. And he's messing around with these women. He's they're dancing for him and all kind of other stuff, right? So Tamas is a lowercase g God who is sexually interacting with human women. But what happens to Tamas? Why are these women weeping for Tamas? This is the important part of the book of Ezekiel because they call it an abomination. He said, you're going to see greater abominations than these. And he's showing Ezekiel what's going on. And these women are weeping for Tamas. The reason they're weeping for Tamas is because Inanna is so mad at what Tamas is done or doing. She catches him in the process that she snitches and he gets dragged to the underworld. Now, what did we say in the first part? That the order went out to root out these watchers that did this to slept with the human women and to bind them in the underworld and so this goddess lowercase g comes and she catches this god lowercase g in the act snitches him out and he gets dragged to the underworld now in the book in the story it says he's dragged there by demons but there are different variations of the story but either way this lowercase g god who ruled pre-flood who was messing with human women gets dragged off to the underworld and again that's outside of the bible but for those people who tell you not to look, we oftentimes just don't look and myself included for a long time. Well, for early years of my life, I didn't look because we were told not to look. And yet every time I looked, I found something interesting and I just kept looking. And after that, it was nobody that could tell me not to look after Missler. I think I was about 15 or so when I first came into Missler and I heard him talk about that. After that, it was nobody that could tell me not to look. So now Inanna is going to come up later. And how do we have all this information? That's probably what you're asking. How do we have all this pre-flood information? It's because they put it on the rocks. They would chisel it into the stone. So it may flood, but the stone is going to survive the flood. So that's a good way to preserve history. This is why the pyramids are still standing and people chisel stuff in there later on. Um, they put hieroglyphics in there later on, uh, according to scientists the hieroglyphics in there right now were not originally placed in there, but we see that putting stuff on stone preserves it for the long run. This is why the commandments were originally written on stone tablets because they would be preserved forever unless somebody broke the tablets, which Moses did when he came down the mountain, he destroyed the tablets immediately, which I always kind of find kind of funny. Uh, God went through the point of putting all that stuff on stone to preserve it. And Moses immediately destroyed it. So anyway, Tam is the Tam story is carved in stone. Now these people are going to come back up. Now I know some of you out there are probably thinking right now, wait a minute, he mentioned the goddess and goddesses aren't in the Bible. And the Bible says there's only male angels and female angels don't exist. So if you are of the belief that the Bible does not mention female angels, and if you're of the belief that the Bible only na names male angels and you want to maintain that belief, now is a time to turn this study off and to go back to doing whatever you want to do. It's that whole red pill, blue pill situation. You can take the blue pill by turning this off and going back and doing whatever you want to do. But if you continue, it is definitely the red pill. So how do you know that the Bible only names male angels? Because this is something that people say all the time. The Bible only names male angels. The Bible only names male angels. The Bible doesn't talk about female angels. This is the this is mythology. Now, now I'm going to teach you some mythology. This is church mythology is that the Bible does not name female angels or female beings or any of this other stuff. Now, let me give you some perspective. The Bible says that there are tons and tons and tons of angels. We know that there were the Benai Elohim in Noah's time. The watchers. The book of Enoch says there's at least 200 of them. And we get a couple of names, but we're not going to count those names. We have the cherubim, the seraphim, 
Uh, we saw the Malachim and all the other ranks of angels. The Bible says one third of the angels um, were with the dragon when he fought against Michael. The Bible also makes another reference, says they're an innumerable number of angels. So there's tons and tons of angels. And the Bible is a very small book in the context of history. I don't care if it's a thousand pages, two thousand pages, even if it was ten thousand pages, it would still be a very small book in the context of history. <coughs> Excuse me. So. The reason I'm giving you this context is because when people say that they read a few names in the Bible and those names of angels were male. And so therefore they built a whole theology around where there's no such thing as female angels because I read these five names and these five names tell me that they're male. So therefore all the other innumerable amount of angels are all male too. This is the, this is the theology. So let's talk about the male names first. Gabriel is mentioned in Daniel eight. We're not going to go too, too deep into the uh, angels right now. Cause again, the angel study is coming. Michael is mentioned in Daniel 10, 13. Satan, we're going to now with Satan in Job 1, 6, we're going to we're going to assume or just just for the benefit of the doubt, we're going to say all the names of Satan count as one angel, Satan, Lucifer, Hillel, all the other names you want to give them. We're going to say there's all one angel. So we have three angels that are named in the Bible, and uh, one of those three angels has a bunch of names. We have a fourth angel, Apollyon or Abaddon or Abaddon, however you want to pronounce it, in Revelation 9-11. He's the angel of the bottomless pit. So we have those four angels mentioned in Scripture. Now, if you want to get into the Apocrypha, we'll say Raphael. He's mentioned in the book of Tobit and Enoch. So we have four and a possible. My space players probably get that reference. We got four and a possible. So now, for those of you who say that there's no such thing as female angels, there's no such thing as female entities, and one of the ways that uh, these people try to explain it away is they'll say, well, that was a vision. But they don't say that same thing when an angel appears in a vision. They don't say, well, that was a vision. Anytime it's a female, they try to explain it away. And I'm going to point out some of the things as I give you these names. The first name I'm going to mention we're going to come across in this study actually is Ashtaroth found in Genesis 14 5 we're going to talk more about Ashtaroth later so I'm not going to talk about it now wisdom in Proverbs 8 there is a strange chapter in which it is written from the first person perspective it is written from a female's point of view the writer refers to their gender as female without a doubt female the the writer or the speaker, I guess you would say, of Proverbs 8, says that they are a created being. They said that they were created from everlasting before the earth was created. And it identifies as a woman, which I just said, female. So you have a female being that refers to herself as wisdom, says she was created and brought up alongside God before the earth was created. Some people have said, hey, this is, this is Christ. Christ does not identify as a woman at any point in the Bible. So that's a problem. It can't be Christ because it identifies as a woman. And also, if you believe that Christ, it says all things were th created through him. But wisdom claims to be a created being. Christ never claims to be a created being. So there's a lot of contradictions here when you try to avoid what's clearly being said. There's a there's a supernatural being um, that refers to the, herself as wisdom, says she was created before mankind and talks about herself as a as a living being. We'll come back to wisdom in a later study. Then there's Lilith mentioned in Isaiah 34, 14, which uh, we're going to talk about in just a second. Because I'm going to give you a sneak preview of um, some of this, uh, some of the mentions of female entities in the Bible. Then you have the queen of heaven, which is mentioned in Jeremiah 44 and other verses. We'll briefly touch on the queen of heaven later on in this study. You have the winged women in a Zechariah five, nine. It's two different winged women. So right now we're up to what? Six, one, two, three, four, five, six. We're up to six mentions of uh, female supernatural entities. And there is a seventh that is often overlooked in Zechariah five, nine. It is the woman who is a clearly a female supernatural being that is sealed in this basket and she is referred to as wickedness. So there are at least seven female 
entities mentioned in the Bible. And yet people will tell you that the only thing mentioned in the Bible are male angels. And that's not true. So we're going to look into two of these and the rest of them. We're going to come back and we get to the angel study. But right now we're going to look into Lilith. Oh, and finally, um, so we have seven mentioned by name. Well, kind of by name. Well, uh, seven mentioned specifically and one alluded to. I'll put it this way. Nike in Revelation 2. Nike, the goddess of victory, is alluded to in Revelation 2, the letter to the church of Ephesus. Now, if you haven't done any research on Ephesus, then you don't know that Nike, Nike was considered the patron saint of or the patron, uh, the patron goddess, not saint, the patron goddess of Ephesus. And so they worship Nike. So if you understand what's being uh, said about them overcoming or victory, Nike was the goddess of victory. So there's a lot of references that seem to attack specifically Nike, the goddess and the prize at the end is a bite from the tree of life, fruit from the tree of life. The Nike's prize for the victorious was a laurel wreath or basically a, a useless tree that they wrapped around their head. So God is saying she gives you this useless tree when you overcome. But if you overcome with me, I'm going to give you a bite from the tree of life. So there's a lot of context there that we don't pick up if we don't understand what's going on outside of the Bible because we don't familiarize ourselves with these things. The writer of Revelation, John, would be familiar with this because he lived in that time. So he understood what was going on and he understood what the context was. But unfortunately, some of us get told, don't go look. And so we just don't go look. People say, well, you can't use anything outside the Bible. And so we just don't use anything outside the Bible. And to me, that is a, a huge disservice to the body of Christ that we're told not to read history or understand history. So now let's get into Lilith, Lilith. <clears throat> so you have to dig deep to come across some of this information. And I don't know who listening has ever been spelunking before, but you are absolutely crazy if you ever go spelunking. Never, ever in life. All right. So Isaiah 34. Now, I mentioned satyrs from Isaiah 13 and talking about the end times. Now, again, I told you if doctrine is based in truth, it'll remain consistent no matter where you go with it. Now, Isaiah 34 is talking about the end times again. Now, tucked in these verses, I'm going to read verses 13 through 15. Tucked in these verses is an interesting reference that if you are just a Bible reader who doesn't dig deeper, you will overlook it. And many people have overlooked it time and time again. So Isaiah 34, 13 through 15 reads and thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court of a court for owls. Now, remember, I said, I think dragons are, are hybrid creatures. Uh, somebody mentioned, they think the dragons and the dinosaurs are one and the same. Very likely, probably just two different classes of dinosaur type uh, creatures. So it says the wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island and the satyr shall cry to his fellow and the screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. All right. So we we talked about in Isaiah 13. It said the satyrs would be there and satyrs were hybrid creatures, wrongfully mixed creatures. It said um, in Revelation that wrongfully mixed spirits would be there. Wrongfully mixed birds would be there. Wrongfully mixed creatures would be there. And here in Isaiah 34, we find it again and it mentions dragons. And I, I said, I think dragons are hybrid creatures. So it stays consistent. Wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. And also satyrs, the satyr shall cry to his fellow. So again, we have a mention of a satyr. We went through all the evidence that people are now mixing stuff. But here we have the mention of a screech owl. And I find it interesting that the screech owls mentioned, because if we go on to verse 15, there shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under the shadow. And there shall be vultures. There shall the vultures also be gathered, everyone with her mate. Now, I did not pull up this um, for this study right here. Isaiah 34, 15. If you want to go to BibleHub.com, type in Isaiah 34, 15, click interlinear, and you will see that this great owl right here, uh, the alternative explanation or the alternative interpretation is a snake. Um, it's not, it may not necessarily be an owl. It could be an owl or a snake. They chose to translate it as owl. But what we want to focus on is the screech owl. Now the screech owl, what caught my attention, I was like, okay, what's the difference between a screech owl and a great owl? So of course I went to the strongs. <clears throat> and so Isaiah 34, 14, it says the night creature. This is the word for screech owl. The screech owl shall rest there. 
the night creature shall find a place for her rest. So I was like, that's interesting, night creature. That could be anything. That could be an owl. That could be any nocturnal animal and not necessarily an owl. So let me click the word and go deeper. 3917. Uh, make sure you pay attention. 3917. So we have 3917. A female night demon. That's interesting. It says now feminine Lilith. Interesting. We see here the word is Lilith. Pronounced Lilith. So Milton says name of a female night demon haunting desolate Edom. Probably borrowed from Babylonian Isaiah 34, 14. This is where we were. Uh, Syriac on the development of legends of Lilith in later Judaism. Okay, so we're getting a lot of interesting references here. And we come down to Strong's Exhaustive and we see Lelil, a night specter. Screech out. <coughs> so we have a reference to Lilith. We have a reference to female night demons. We have a rep reference to Babylon. We have a reference to, um, and right here, Milton, uh, Milton's uh, book, I think it was um, not the Divine Comedy that was written by Dante. Uh, Milton wrote uh, Paradise Lost. Uh, we have a reference to a night hag. We have the Assyrian Lilitu mentioned. So we have a lot of stuff to go on. And me, I like to kind of dig into all this stuff. But over here, it shows you a couple of translations in the Englishman's Concordance. Um, you have the Hebrew translation. You have the uh, New American Standard, NAS. Yes, the night monster will settle. Interesting. Not translated as Screech Owl. KJV Screech Owl. In an uh, INT. I'm not sure what that is. There, there will settle the night and will find a resting. So it left out part of it. So we have owl. We have monster. We have night demon. We have all this stuff, right? So let's continue digging up. Now, for those of you who are wanting to believe this was an owl still even after seeing the words again you're going to have another chance this is your last chance to get off of this study because what we're about to get into is going to be way 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 in left field from anything you've ever heard in a church before anything you ever heard in a camp before anything you probably ever discussed with another believer before so if you don't want your perspective of the real world messed up i suggest you turn off the study now but for those of you who are ready to go off of the deep end and really start to digging into a lot of these, or some of the verses, not a lot, uh, you know, we have a limited amount of time, but the ones just really start digging into these verses, we're about to do that. So the first one I looked up was Lilith. I just put in Lilith in Google, as you can see. Lilith is a figure in Jewish mythology developed earliest in the Babylonian Talmud. Lilith is often envisioned as a dangerous demon of the night who is sexually, um, that's where that one cuts off. Come down here to myjewishlearning.com. Lilith is the most notorious demon in Jewish tradition. In some sources, she is conceived as the original woman created even before Eve. We'll come back to that in a second. So here's the rest of the Wikipedia inscription. Um, Lilith is a figure in Jewish mythology developed earliest in the Babylonian Talmud. Lilith is often envisioned as a dangerous demon of the night who is sexually wanton and who steals babies in the darkness. So now we have a, another bit of information. They already said that Lilith is associated with Jewish mythology. Um, now we see that she is sexually wanton and she steals babies in the darkness. Why would that creature be mentioned in the book of Isaiah as inhabiting Babylon in the last days, a demonic female entity for those who don't believe that there are any female entities in the Bible, but let's keep going. So I pulled up the little Wikipedia entry to see the whole thing. So, Right here, sexually one who steals babies in the darkness. Lilith may be linked in part to a historically earlier class of female demons in ancient Mesopotamia region found in cuneiform text, cuneiform text in Sumer, the Akkadian Empire, Assyria, and Babylonia. So now this stretches across multiple empires. We're not going to get into her being Adam's first wife. Uh, we may tackle that later. But we come down to here. Um, at the end in Hebrew language text, the term Lilith or Lilith translated as night creatures, night monster, night hag, or screech owl first occurs in the list of animals in Isaiah 34, 14, either in singular or plural form, according to the variations in the earliest manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The term first occurs, occurs in a list of monsters in Jewish magical inscriptions on bowls and amulets of the sixth century CE onwards. Lilith, Lilith is identified as a female demon as first visual de and the first visual depictions appear. So. We have visual depictions of Lilith. 
So here we go. We pull this up, right? This is further down. So this is Wikipedia. You scroll further down the page right here. Now I'm going to read this, the bird footed woman in the Bernie relief. Now this is important right here because it's going to mention another female demon that, or female entity that we're going to run across in the Bible. And I separate uh, demons from angels, which, which is why I'm using the word entity versus angel or demon right now. Cause when we get into the angels and demons study, I'll clarify a lot of this stuff later. It says Kramer's this is the bird footed woman in the Bernie relief. Kramer's translation of the Gilgamesh fragment. Didn't we mention Gilgamesh before? So now when Isaiah 13 is 34, he's giving you a list of stuff. We didn't go from a screech owl. Now we're back at Gilgamesh who I mentioned in study one. See, all of this stuff ties together. When you are looking at truth, all of this stuff keeps coming back around. And the Gilgamesh fragment was used by Henry Frankfurt and Emil Kreis, uh, Kraling to support identification of a woman with wings and bird feet in the burning relief as related to Lilith. But this has been rejected by later sources, including the British Museum. So now it's getting interesting. This isn't actually Lilith, which is in the current possession of the piece. The terracotta plaque depicts a beautiful naked goddess like Sylph with bird like features who stands atop two lions and between two owls. Although once believed to be the actual image of Lilith, it is now thought to possibly represent Inanna. Wasn't Inanna uh, the, the goddess, lowercase g, married to Tammuz who caught him with the human women and sent the demons after him to drag him back to the under or to drag him down into the underworld? So now Inanna pops up again. So this depiction that they thought was Lilith turns out to be Inanna and look how she's depicted. I'm going to put a bigger picture up here in a second. Uh, the Sumerian goddess of love, fertility, beauty, war, and sexual desire. The depiction of the nocturnal and predatory owls, however, have led many to believe the relief is an affirmation of Lilith's role as a demon who flies about the underworld, delivering night terrors to those who sleep. For those of you who are familiar with night terrors or sleep paralysis... Now you understand that sleep paralysis tracks all the way back to Babylon. It tracks all the way back to the Old Testament. It mentions a creature that gives people night terrors or sleep paralysis. For those of you who experienced it, you are probably well aware of what sleep paralysis is. For those of you who have not, I encourage you to Google sleep paralysis and learn about what it is. Many people, including myself, have experienced it, and there is a supernatural element to sleep paralysis. I'm not saying that this is the um, source of sleep paralysis. I'm just saying that even back then in the Babylonian era, they were attributing sleep paralysis to a supernatural entity. So this should not be here. If there are no such thing as female entities in the Bible, then we shouldn't have a reference to a female supernatural entity and we shouldn't have a depiction. So there is a dispute as to whether this is Lilith or Inanna. But notice that she is described with two wings. Go read the book of Zechariah, chapter five, where it mentions the three women. Two of the women are described as having two wings like storks. Now, Inanna, again, if this is Inanna, this presents an interesting situation, which we're going to talk about. And remember, the IgG were mentioned. I mentioned the IgG. And we showed how they were depicted. Now, either this is a coincidence or these two are the male and female of the same, we'll say species, angels. But we're going to find it is consistent. Like I said, go read the book of Zechariah. If you want a description of female supernatural entities with wings, they are described as having two wings. Now, the legs are not described in Zechariah. But what we're looking at, both of these depictions come from sources outside of the Bible, and they seem to be describing male and female angels. And we know that something female exists. Isaiah, at minimum, believed in a supernatural female entity because he he names Lilith, Lilith, however you pronounce it. You guys know what I'm saying. So we're going to come back to Inanna. So now, like I said, this shouldn't be here. If we're not supposed to look outside the Bible because all of this stuff is fake and it doesn't matter, none of this stuff should be here. But it is there. And so I kept digging. I said, okay, let me see how this is translated in other translations because as we saw on the sidebar, it had a bunch of different translations. So here, the American King James translates a screech owl. The American Standard, Night Monster. Uh, this one, the, the Brenton Septuagint leaves the word out altogether. The Dewey Rames uses the word Lamia. The Darby Bible uses the word Lilith. Uh, English Revised uses the word Night Monster. Uh, Screech Island Webster's Bible. 
World English is night creature and Young's literal uses the word night owl. So now we have a bunch of different translations. But the one that stood out to me the most was Lamia in um, the Dewey Rames. Because we already looked up Lilith. We, we saw who Lilith was according to Darby. But I said, you know what? Let me look up Lamia because that's a new word right there that we haven't looked at yet. So then I Googled Lamia. As you can see, I just Googled Lamia. You get 25 million results. Lamia was a child devouring sea monster or night haunting demon. She was a daughter of Poseidon and mother of the monster Skyla um, and Achilles. Lamia was originally a Libyan queen loved by Zeus. Interesting. A Libyan queen. The Libya is in Africa. But we'll come back to that. When we do the actual full study on Lamia and some of the other stuff. Now, if we come down to Wikipedia entry, Lamia in ancient Greek mythology was a woman who became a child eating monster after her children were destroyed by Hera, who learned of her husband Zeus tryst with her. So now we have the mention of another lowercase g God messing with human women. And Zeus is notorious for this. But let me show you something. What did Lilith do? Lilith was a night creature, a night demon that stole babies in the darkness. We see that Lamia is a night haunting daemon, or we'll talk about the daemon, or demon. And then down here, it says she's a child eating monster. So is it possible they're talking about the same entity, even though we're talking about two different names? Well, let's keep digging. And people say, I thought it was a night owl. A screech owl or whatever they call it. Uh, yeah, a screech owl. And this is what happens when we're told not to look further. We're just told and we don't look. So I decided to look for depictions of Lamia because they're descriptions of Lamia. And the description I found was pretty interesting. Now, to give you some context, it is extremely hard to find artwork that is not topless and I was trying to keep this as family friendly as possible so these are not nude pictures I had to sift through all the uh, topless pictures of these drawings to find a depiction and lo and behold there is a depiction of of Lamia with actual clothes on she's barely covered but she's covered uh, more so than the other pictures I found but all of them depict her like this now for my mythology fans for those who have seen Clash of the Titans the original and the newer two versions of it, you will recognize uh, Medusa from the uh, the new first one and the original. And Medusa is depicted just like this. Didn't I point to you guys uh, to Medusa before? We're going to talk about the Naga and the Serpentine creatures later on. But there are a whole class of creatures throughout the Bible. Well, not throughout the Bible. This this one section in the Bible, Isaiah 34, and throughout different cultures, they're referred to as the Naga. And it is believed that something was tampering with their DNA and created a lot of snake human hybrids. There's one, if I recall, I, I, I want to make sure I'm right. I think it's the book of Jasher and not not Enoch or Jubilees. I believe it's in the book of Jasher. I'm going to have to verify that, but there's one mentioned in the book of Jasher and they are mentioned all over the world. And as we see, there is a possible translation of one in the Bible, even though it's called a screech owl. Now, again, either all this stuff is coincidence or Isaiah and revelation and Genesis and Christ. They're all intentionally mentioning a t mentioning a time that would lead to the corruption of all flesh and be full of hybrids. We keep finding this consistently. So I'm not saying Medusa was necessarily real, but the Medusa myth may be based on something that has a basis in reality. All the stuff that we call mythology may not be fake. So let's talk about post flood problems. We're going to get back on track because we, that was a little, that was a little side quest. Um, but we're now we're going to get back to the main topic, the post flood problems. We talked about pre flood stuff. Now we're going to talk about post flood problems. We're going to start with the Epic of Gilgamesh because the Epic of Gilgamesh, according to the time frame, is going to take place closest to the end of Noah's flood from the stories we have. 
Now, before I mention Goliath is a famous hybrid, Gilgamesh is a famous hybrid, and Hercules is a famous hybrid. We haven't talked about Hercules too much. We'll come back to Hercules later. We're going to definitely come back to Goliath when we get to the promised land. But for now, we're going to talk about Gilgamesh, the guy who can hold a lion like a cat under one arm. So does the time frame fit? That's the first question I had. If we're going to say that now, let me give you a uh, background real quick so I don't get out of context. I talked about it in part one for those who missed part one. Gilgamesh, the story is he went looking for the survivor of the flood to find the secret to immortality. Now, either this is a myth or there's some basis in reality. And if it's a myth, none of the time frame should fit. For those who did not catch my um, study on Daniel and Zoroaster, how I put together all the pieces. And it is my belief that Daniel could have possibly been Zoroaster, same person. Um, you'll understand that I point out that if these are coincidences, the time frame shouldn't overlap or even come close. Uh, myths should just be wild guesses, right? But we'll see here. Answers in Genesis.org. I went there to find an unbiased source that had nothing to do with anything I'm trying to prove. What this article is, and you guys can see it here. Um, what this article is, is they're calculating around the time of when Noah's flood would have possibly happened. <clears throat> and so in this calculation, I find it interesting. It's, I believe there's a lot of stuff missing when uh, we try to calculate the time, fl time frames of history. There's a lot of stuff not accounted for, especially by Bible scholars who try to use the Bible to calculate. Um, they don't account for large gaps of time that, are, that we're missing from certain Bible passages. And sometimes it's overlooked and sometimes they just, you know, run with it anyway. Anyway, point being, the conclusion that Answers in Genesis comes up with is that it roughly happened around 2348 BC. So 2348 BC is around the time they put it. So I decided to look up on the Sumerian Kings list um, where Gilgamesh ruled. Remember I mentioned Demuzid the fisherman is different from Demuzid the shepherd, not the same uh, person. This is a human. Uh, Demuzid the, the shepherd is the lowercase g God. So you have Gilgamesh here. Gilgamesh ruled around circa 2600 BC and they used the word circa because the estimate not exact. So you're going to see the word circa 2600 BC. And I told you, I believe these are off. Uh, the zeros are off right here. So they probably didn't reign as long as they, you know, claim to have reigned. But Nimrod, or it's not, not Nimrod, Gilgamesh. We'll come back to Nimrod in a second. Gilgamesh rules circa 2600 BC. So does the time frame fit? So I did the math. 2600 minus 2348 equals 252 years. So there's a 252 year um, give or take period, right? Well, that doesn't matter because if you read Genesis, you know that Noah lived an additional 350 years after the flood. So even with the estimated time frame of which Nimrod, I'm not, why do I keep saying Nimrod? We'll come back to Nimrod in just a second. Gilgamesh ruled we will see that it is possible that he could have went looking for Noah, Utnapishtim, who I believe is Noah from um, the Epic of Gilgamesh. There is a there is a 148 year period. No, wait, I'm sorry about uh, a little less than that, not 148 years, um, less than that. But yeah, he has 200. So they're within 252 years of each other. Noah lived 98 years beyond this so the 98 year period where he could have looked for noah so just understand that these dates are circa not exact but he does fit the time frame for the story to have an element of truth that's my point it says these dates are estimates that put noah and gilgamesh within the same time frame as each other and for those who don't know what this uh image is it is gilgamesh killing the bull of heaven uh him and enkidu uh, they killed the bull of heaven together. Yeah. If you want to read that, you guys can go read that story. We're going to come back to that later because you're going to find, I didn't cover it in here cause I didn't want to get into the Anunnaki. Uh, but I will give you a brief background after the flood, the Anunnaki hide in a forest. Why are they hiding? Probably because as we read in Enoch, um, that, and Jubilees that they were being rounded up. The, the ones who, um, some of the ones who rebelled and took part, um, in sleeping with human women. It doesn't say only the watchers did it though. Just understand that there are other angels around that were on earth. So there may have been a reason that they were hiding. It doesn't necessarily say the Anunnaki slept with human women. I haven't found one yet specifically, 
Uh, but there is probably a reason why they're hiding. And you also see that they have a giant as a guard, Humbaba. And he is a hybrid giant, not just in the sense of a Nephilim mixed with human, but he's mixed with other animals. Says he has like the face of a lion. We're going to talk about Humbaba when we come back to the lion men of Moab. He's definitely going to come up. So anyway, the reason I'm telling you about Gilgamesh in the first place is because Gilgamesh stopped being mythology in 2003. It says Gilgamesh tomb believed to be found. Believed found. This is from BBC News. Archaeologists in Iraq believe they may have found the lost tomb of King Gilgamesh, the subject of the oldest book in history. The Epic of Gilgamesh, written by a Middle Eastern scholar 2,500 years before the birth of Christ, commemorated the life of the ruler of the city of Uruk, from which Iraq gets its name. So you see the tie-in? Uruk, Iraq, that's tied to the Epic of Gilgamesh. So when people tell you this stuff is all mythology, we have proof right here. We have countries named after this stuff. Now, a German-led expedition has discovered what it thought to be the entire city of Uruk, including where the Euphrates once flowed, the last resting place of its famous king. So if you guys want to chase that down, you can. Um, but basically, they found the tomb of Gilgamesh. So again, this stuff is not mythology in the sense of all this stuff is lies and they just made up these stories to explain stuff. They're starting to find physical evidence that think these things happened. So now... The reason I kept saying Nimrod, I'm going to come back to Nimrod. Well, I told you I was going to come back to Nimrod, but now we're going to come back to Gilgamesh later. The Nimrod conspiracy. So there is a belief taught by some that Nimrod found a way to become a Nephilim. Uh, if you remember in part one, I mentioned somatic parahumans. I do not believe that Nimrod became a Nephilim. Let me say that very clearly. But some do. However, if you read the text, it says you, you know that Nimrod didn't become a Nephilim because of Genesis 10, 9. It says he became a Gaborim. It says he became Gaborim. That means mighty. And it says he also became a Gaborim hunter before the Lord. So if you're going to say the word Gaborim is Nephilim, the same as a giant, then you have to ask, how do you interpret the words? He became a Gaborim hunter before the Lord. Did he become a Nephilim that hunts or did he become a hunter of Nephilim? What do you do with that? So, I don't believe that Nimrod was a Nephilim at all. Now, the second thing about Nimrod we're going to touch on. Now, I, I touch more on Nimrod. If you go to the Addressing the Evidence series, part one, the Hamites, I talk way more about Nimrod. I give you his background. I give you his lineage. He's a Cushite. He's a Hamite, which is going to come up here. Nimrod is not the same person as Gilgamesh, even though some people try to make him out to be. Gilgamesh, his father was a god, lowercase g. Nimrod's father was Cush. Nimrod wouldn't need to go looking for a survivor of the flood because Ham was his grandfather. He could have just talked to his grandfather or he could have just talked to Cush, his own father, because I'm sure Ham told his son about the flood and going through that. That's a story you tell over and over and over again, how you survive the end of the world. That story never gets old. As we can see, that story never got old. We're here thousands of years later and we're still talking about it. So he wouldn't have had to go look. And Nimrod's great grandfather was Noah. He could have talked to Noah, a.k.a. Utnapishtim himself. So there's no con nothing that would link Nimrod to Gilgamesh, except for possibly the same time frame in which they lived. But again, Nimrod was not a hybrid. Gilgamesh was born a hybrid. There's a difference. So let's go even further we're gonna talk about the term mighty one real quick i told you gabor cannot possibly mean nephilim and here we see that nimrod began to be a mighty one 1368 gabor 1368 gabor mighty a warrior valiant strong mighty 1368 just remember that because i'm gonna show you some other verses because in first samuel we see a benjamite who is 1368 gabor but yet these same people don't say he's a nephilim because he's from the tribe of benjamin here in first samuel talking about the son of jesse i believe this um this is the verse about david i believe or it might be about the older son i have to go back and read the whole thing for context but um here we have the son of jesse who we know is not a nephilim and so because we know let me get this right here so because we know that jesse Jesse's son is not a Nephilim. We can look at this word, 1368, Gabor, mighty. 
and see that he is not a Nephilim. So again, if your doctrine is based in truth, it'll be consistent. If it's based in, you just want to make stuff up to have something to talk about. I'm going to say Rob Skiba again, because Rob Skiba is one of the ones teaching this nonsense. And you'll find that if you follow Rob Skiba, he jumps off into every weird thing you can possibly think of, not because it's based in truth, but because it's contrary, just, just on the basis of it being contrary and it gets a lot of buzz, he'll jump off into it. So yeah, you guys will see that. I don't even have to keep telling you guys what he's into. You guys can go read his work and watch his videos for yourself. But we see the word Gibor is used of a Benjamite. It's used of um, one of Jesse's sons who are from Judah. <clears throat> and we'll see it used elsewhere. But <clears throat> basically, Nimrod was not a Nephilim and Nimrod was, Nimrod was not Gilgamesh. So Lot and the last days. And I promise you guys, all this stuff is going to tie back together. I'm not giving you random bits of information. I'm going to tie all of this stuff back together. So we're going to talk about Lot in the last days. Lot being the son or the, the nephew of Abraham, the son of Abraham's dead brother. Now, in Luke 17, which is also the Olivet Discourse, last time I came from Matthew 24, but in Luke 17, which is also the Olivet Discourse, we have another piece of the puzzle given to us by Christ. So I'll read uh, Luke 17, uh, verses 26 through 30. And he's going to reference the days of Noah, just like Matthew did. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the son of man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise. So it's telling you the same thing. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the son of man is revealed. Who was eating and drinking in the days of Lot? So we saw in the days of Noah, we saw who was marrying and giving a marriage. It was human women and angels. But who was eating and drinking in, in the days of Lot? The angels came in and ate and drank with Lot. But we don't see them getting married in those days right there. Right. So we see we see a compare and contrast. It's interesting in the story of um, in the story of Noah, we see the angels marrying and giving a marriage, but we don't see them eating. And in the days of Lot, we see them eating, but we don't see them, see them being married or given in marriage. We have a compare and contrast there in the days of Noah. The angels were pursuing the human women. And in the days of Lot, the humans were pursuing the angels. Again, compare and contrast. So let's talk about World War One. We're going to talk about the days a lot. So the days a lot do not start with Sodom and Gomorrah. I mentioned that last time. The days a lot actually start prior to the, the um, Sodom and Gomorrah events uh, that we know as the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, there's going to be a war with five kings. I went over this a little bit more in depth in the Addressing the Evidence series. So I'm not going to go into that part of the story right now. Right now, what I want to talk about is the king. So you have four kings versus five. You have Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Shedalomar, Shed, sure, uh, how do you say his name? Shedalomar, I think I missed the D in there. The king of Elam, title, king of Gentiles. Now, quick detour. I point this out in addressing the evidence, but I'm going to point it out now, and I'm also going to bring it up again when we do the Gentile study. Tidal is king of the Gentiles. For those of you who have been taught, Gentiles are everybody except for Israel. Please show me that in the Bible. Pull up the pull up the verse in the Bible that tells you the uh, Gentiles are everybody except for Israel. For those of you who watch the addressing the evidence study, you know that Gentiles are the descendants of Japheth based on Genesis chapter 10. They tell you that the descendants of Japheth are the Gentiles. The other problem is that all these kings, Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemember, uh, king of Zeboim, and the unnamed king of Zoar, they all serve Shedelah Omar, king of Elam. So if the Gentiles are everybody except for Israelites or Jews, however you want to say it, then Tidal, king of the Gentiles, should have been king of everybody and not subservient to Elam. They would not have need to mention any of these other people because none of these people are Israelites if everybody is a Gentile except for the Israelites. He would have just been Tidal, king of everyone. But he specifically pointed out that he's king of the Goyim or the Gentiles who I believe are the descendants of Japheth. And we're going to see some of that in a second. Now, 
we go through this king's list. So you have the four kings versus the five kings, and there's an unnamed king of Zoar. Why is that king unnamed? That always interested me. Why didn't they name that king? So you go look him up, and you look up the word Zoar, 6820, and it means insignificance. So this king of Zoar, Zoar was a small town so insignificant that they either purposely did not write the name of the king or didn't remember the name of the king when this was written. <clears throat> now, this is important. I think it was intentionally left out. I don't think that it was that they didn't remember, but I think the leaving out the name of the king was intentional to show you how insignificant the city of Zoar is. So insignificant that it doesn't even deserve to have a mention of their king. So, when this war breaks out, we see here, uh, Genesis 14, verse 1, and it came to pass, these all these kings right here, um, says that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom. So these four kings uh, right here, these four kings are going to make four, make war with these five kings, four kings versus five. So these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemember, uh, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. It says all these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Shedola Omar, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. So we have a time frame. They're subservient for 12 years. The 13th year that we had enough, they rebel. And look what happens in the 14th year, though. This is where we get another interesting reference. Remember, Christ says, likewise, as the days of Lot, it's going to be like this. And in the 14th year came Shetel Omar and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth, Kernaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims in Shava, Karathiam, and the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Um, we're, we're going to talk about all of these. The Horites in Mount Seir. So those who recognize Mount Seir, you know Mount Seir is um, associated with Edom or Esau. We're going to come back to all of these in a minute. So Sodom has a bunch of names. And if you look into them, all of these are giants except for possibly the Horites. And we'll talk about the Horites in a minute. But they have giant allies and the first one we're going to look at is the Rafa the Ra the 7497 Raphaim or the Raphites they keep coming up throughout the Old Testament the Rafa 7497 is what you guys see is the same one 7497 inhabitant of an area east of the Jordan Raphaim inhabitants of the area east of Jordan right so you see this Raphaim 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 and you come down here Deuteronomy 2.11 is translated as giants. If you go down here to the Browns Drig, uh, Brown Driver Briggs, proper name of a people, old race of giants. <clears throat> right down here in the Strong's Concordance, giants, Rafa, Raphaims, in the sense of invigorating, a giant. So we see that the Rafa are considered giants. And later on, when we get further in, we're going to talk about some of the legends that come from the Rafa, such as the Walking Dead or a.k.a. the zombies. And I'll tell you why they were referred to as the Walking Dead later. Or if you have my book, Beyond Flesh and Blood, you probably already know why they're called the Walking Dead. So you have the Rafa and think about this strategically, militarily, military, strategically wise or however you want to say that. The first thing they did was, remember, they're outnumbered. It's five kings versus four kings. The four kings, the first thing they did was they slaughtered the allies of Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to see that Sodom and Gomorrah responds to this slaughter by coming to fight. So the, make no mistake, these are allies of Sodom and Gomorrah and the, and the other cities on the plain, these hybrid uh, tribes. So they come to their rescue. And you'll see right here the name Zamzimim equal uh, tall. We're going to come back to... Uh, Zamzimim later on but these giant tribes are there so strategically it makes sense that while you have your men at full force and they're at a hundred percent that you go attack the giants or the hybrids first before you go attack the humans if you know that once you attack the humans and they and you know you're at war you're going to take casualties but then after you take those casualties then the giants are going to probably respond and come help their human allies so what you do strategically is you take out the giants first so that the people are caught off guard. And by the time they react, you've already taken out the biggest part of your problem, literally the biggest part of your problem. So once again, we run into Astaroth. 
Because remember, right here, he smoked the Rephaims in Astaroth Karnaim. Why are they living in Astaroth Karnaim? Because the Rephaim worship Astaroth. I told you this picture is going to come back up again. We're going to keep running into this female supernatural entity that's, uh, according to some believers, don't exist because female supernatural entities don't exist in their um, context because they've already decided that because they don't believe in it, no matter what evidence they find, they're not going to believe in it. And, it, and it's, again, to me, a position of ignorance to say that you're not going to believe anything simply because it's not in the Bible, because most of human history is not in the Bible. Check the Bible for cars and Internet and cell phones and street lights and refrigeration. Like none of that stuff is in the Bible, we, but we know it exists. So for somebody to come thousands of years later and say, hey, don't look at anything that was going on. You know, it to me, it doesn't make sense. But again, Astaroth, they live in Astaroth. They worship Astaroth. Now, Astaroth right here is interesting, is alive and well at the local Starbucks. Um, Astaroth, a star, the principal female divinity of the Phoenicians. So now we're bringing a whole nother culture in. Uh, the Phoenicians are tied to the Canaanites, for those that don't know, called Ishtar by the Assyrians and Astarte by the Greeks and Romans. There's an overlap between Astaroth, the female goddess, and Astaroth, who is. We're going to read some more of that. But Astaroth, notice, Ishtar by the Assyrians, Astarte by the Greeks and Romans. For those of you who recognize the name Ishtar, then you know that of its possible links to the celebration of Easter. Why would Christ point to a time in which hybrid giants were worshiping a female entity associated with Easter? And now in our modern time, lots of people celebrate Easter as the resurrection of Christ. But it keeps all the fertility rituals. Remember, we're going to come back to this, but these goddesses, this one in particular, uh, Astaroth is the goddess of fertility. It's got sex, rabbits, eggs, all these things represent Astaroth or Ishtar or Astarte. And we're going to see Aphrodite as well. We're going to see all of these other female sex uh, goddesses that are worshipped using fertility-like objects. But Christ points to a time, the days a lot, in which this was going on. This, To our knowledge, we're going to come back. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So Astaroth, we're coming to the Wikipedia entry. Astaroth, Kernayim. Also renders Astaroth, Kernayim was a city in the land of Bashan, east of the Jordan River. So this is the location, right? So we know the name of the goddess, Astaroth. They live here. We know they worship Astaroth, which we're going to see. Um, and we see the name Bashan. For those of you familiar with the Bible, when we get into the promised land, there's going to be a giant king, Og, king of Bashan. We're going to talk about him. So Astarte. Astarte is the Hellenized form of the Middle Eastern goddess Astaroth. Right here, we see uh, Astaroth, Astaroth, same thing. Um, Northwest Semitic Astaroth, Karnaim, Astarte was called Astaroth in the Hebrew Bible and was a city in the land of Bashan, east of the Jordan River. So let's talk about Astarte. So you go to Astarte from Astaroth because it says she's associated with Astarte. Uh, the Hellenized form of the Middle Eastern goddess Astaroth, a form of Ishtar, which I just mentioned with Easter, worshipped from the Bronze Age through classical antiquity the name is particularly associated with her worship in the ancient levant among the canaanites and phoenicians so you're going to see that the rafa the rafa are in canaan the rafa are all over the place the um the uh, locations of sodom and gomorrah in the plain are in or very near canaan depending on who you uh look at for the maps um but she is worshiped all throughout canaan she was also celebrated in egypt following the uh, importation of Levantine cults there. The name Astarte is sometimes also applied to her cults in Mesopotamia and Mesopotamian cultures like Assyria and Babylonia. So we see that this belief in Astarte or Astaroth is everywhere. But if we continue down, we're going to find an interesting link here. Astarte was connected, connected with fertility, sexuality, and war blah 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 we go read on to here the deity takes many names and forms among different cultures and according to canaanite mythology is one of the names is one and the same as the assyrio babylonian goddess ishtar or easter taken from the third millennium bc sumerian goddess inanna once again inanna pops up we see she popped up connected to isaiah 34 
We see she's mentioned, uh, well, she's not mentioned in the Sumerian Kings list. We find Demuzid, who is bar uh, married to N Inanna, and she snitches him out, and he gets dragged to the underworld for messing around with these human women. And now we see that she's being worshipped by the hybrid giants in the story of Lot. They live there in Astaroth. They worship Astaroth. Astaroth is associated with Ishtar or Easter or Astarte or Inanna. So we're going to we're going to see a nana keep popping up. We're going to come back to that. And then we have the Zuzims or Zamzumims. We uh, briefly touched on them because we're going to come back to them later. Um, Aboriginal giants this is according to Miriam Webster. Aboriginal giants reported in the Old Testament to have inhabited the region of Ammon. Uh, that was one of the sons of Lot uh, prior to the coming of the Ammonites. Compare Anakim, Emim, and Rephaim, which we're going to do later. So now. In the title, I mentioned Bigfoot. This is going to bring us to the whole tribe of Bigfoot in the Bible. All right. Now, before we continue, for those of you who have not yet clicked the like button, please click the like button right now before we continue to the whole tribe of Bigfoot. You can always unlike it later if you don't like it, but click the like button real quick. If you like it, if you're watching it, for those of you watching on your phone, exit out of the live chat, click the like button, go back in the live chat. It's only going to take one second. All right, so let's talk about the whole tribe of Bigfoot. Now, the reason I even touched on this, because I usually just keep stuff like this to myself, because it sounds crazy to people who have not gone and done the digging or the research. So for those of you who have any kind of cable account or Hulu, you can go to the historychannel.com and find this episode of Ancient Aliens, uh, season four, episode seven, Aliens and Bigfoot. This is uh, it aired March 23rd, 2012. This is um, briefly touched upon in my book, but not really because I found it kind of after they did it. And I thought it'd be interesting to just to go in and see, hey, is Bigfoot in the Bible? So not only did I find what I believe may be Bigfoot again, maybe, but not just one, but a whole tribe. Now, in this in the episode, I'm going to give you some context of the research in the episode. They go looking for Bigfoot. In the Bible, throughout different uh, cultures, and they do pull up some some interesting stuff, but not from the Bible. Uh, in the Bible, they got close, but they danced all around it because, in my opinion, a lot of the Bible scholars or experts, um, so called, that appear on Ancient Aliens, are amateurs. All they did was go to seminary. They got some letters behind their names. They have their doctors, their PhDs, and all they've been trained to do is parrot what other people have told them to believe. And so they parrot this belief, even when it comes to the ancient alien beliefs, they don't go too far outside of the accepted norm. Um, even when it comes when it comes to the Bible as well, they'll they'll uh, tap dance around the ancient alien belief, uh, but they stay mostly to the Bible. Now, in this episode, they did connect Bigfoot with UFOs and aliens. And I said, OK, that's interesting. I hadn't done too much research into that. Now, they do a good job of connecting um, Bigfoot to aliens and UFOs. Now, as I've said before, I believe that aliens are fallen angels. So that prompted my curiosity. And I said, okay, Bigfoot is a giant according to the, to the legends and Bigfoot. If it's associated with aliens, which are fallen angels, Bigfoot is very likely a hybrid creature. Remember all flesh had become corrupt on the earth. And, and Christ said the days of Noah would be like the time when he returns. So there's a big, a Bigfoot out there, a, a giant, hybrid creature in the forest associated with what I believe to be fallen angels. So of course I'm going to do some digging. So that's, that's the background that led to this research right here. Now, again, if you don't agree, that's fine. We always say, some of us always say, chew the meat, spit out the bones. It's not important to salvation or anything. So if you don't want to believe it, if you don't care to believe it, whatever, it's just something interesting that you can have in your arsenal when somebody brings up Bigfoot. So one of the tribes, the Emims, which uh, they started to slaughter. And we saw in um, when they when they went in and started to slaughter uh, the giants, the Rephaim, the Emim is next on the list. Matter of fact, let me go back real quick and show you right here. The Emims, this is who they slaughtered, the Emims. All right, so we're going to go forward. So the Emims, you look up the word it is 368. Emim, terrors, an inhabitant of Moab. They are called the terrors. Right here, plural, Emim, terrors, ancient inhabitants of Moab. 
terrors. Emim, an early Canaanitish or Moabitish tribe, Emims. So at first it's like, okay, they're called the terrors. That doesn't tell us anything. But if we continue down with the brown driver Briggs, terror, dread. Okay, so we know that they're scared of these things. Terror, dread. Now, predicate of snorting of a war horse of teeth of a crocodile. Interesting. Plural figurative idols. Dreadful, shocking things. So teeth of a crocodile. That's interesting. So you come down here. Dread, fear, horror, idol, terror, terrible, terror, or shortened rema from the same as ayam, fright, concrete, and idol as a bugbear. Dread, fear, horror, idol, terrible, terror. So we see all these terrible words associated with the email. But we know that they're a tribe because they went down there and started killing them. They weren't idols. These were actual tribe. But the word that stands out the most is bugbear. Now, bugbear is interesting because if you Google a bugbear, you will get this definition. A cause of obsessive fear, irritation, or loathing. Nothing concrete, but you come down here archaic. An imaginary being invoked to frighten children. Typically a sort of hobgoblin supposed to devour them. In part one, didn't we say that the giants were cannibals giant cannibals right now continue down bugbear a this is wikipedia entry a bugbear is a legendary creature or type of hobgoblin comparable to the boogeyman or a bugaboo or babao or kukui and other creatures of folklore all of which were historically used in some cultures to frighten disobedient children so this theme of eating children comes up again because remember in Isaiah, we just detoured to Isaiah. We saw that this uh, female night monster, the Lee Leaf, was a monster that ate children. So we see cannibalism once again. And now we see these emim are associated with a bugbear, which is a giant or this, the bugbear eats children. It's like the boogeyman. So I said, OK, let me go look for depictions of a bugbear and see what a bugbear looks like. And there's a ton of these depictions. So I just chose one. And they're all pretty much the same. What does this look like to you? To me, it looks like a Bigfoot in armor. And it, it seems kind of funny. Like just looking at it is like, okay, that that's probably a reach. Alligator teeth. These aren't necessarily teeth like an alligator, but they do look like the teeth of a carnivore. Now that looks funny until you put it side by side with the depiction of a North American Bigfoot. Look at the arm length. Look at the leg length. It's covered in hair. It with the exception of the ears. It very closely resembles an armored Bigfoot. Now, we see in the book of Lot, or not in the book of Lot, the uh, book of Genesis, uh, in the time of Noah, we know how the giants are created. They're, they're hybrids. They come from angels and humans. And some of the stories, they may have been mixed with other creatures, not just angels and humans. Uh, as we're going to see in the story of Humbaba, when we get there, uh, he has a face of a lion. So you'll start to see various mixtures of these. But again, putting these side by side, it's hard to deny that there are similarities between the description of North American Bigfoot in modern times and a depiction of what some people believe the ancient bugbear looked like. Now, there's a whole tribe of these. Now you're starting to see that why strategically it makes sense to go kill these guys first. Not after you attack Sodom and the other five people, you go kill these guys first by surprise. Because notice when they rebelled, the other kings rebelled. These tribes, these giant tribes were not mentioned as part of the rebellion. He seems to attack them out of nowhere. But we see later that the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other three uh, cities come to their aid. So, again, is it just a coincidence that the bugbear from ancient mythology looks like an armored version of Bigfoot from modern day accounts? Is it a coincidence that ancient aliens has connected Bigfoot to aliens who I believe are fallen angels? Like all of this stuff is connected. These are not standalone incidents. So when you see these things um, and you don't understand where they're coming from and you don't understand their connection to the Bible and it's not making any sense to you why all this supernatural stuff is occurring in our modern time because you haven't heard it from your pastor or in your camp or from whoever. 
Now it's going to make sense because you could tie it back into the Bible and say, wait, all this stuff is in the Bible and Christ pointed to it. He said it's going to be like the days of Noah. It's going to be like the days of Lot. So let's continue to the Horites. And I said the Horites may or may not be um, giants. And let me give a disclaimer. The Horites, it's some people have pointed out that the Horites genealogy doesn't appear in the Bible. But there may be a valid um reasonable explanation for that so after you get to a certain point the descendants of ham are no longer mentioned in the bible um genealogy wise uh same thing with the uh, descendants of japheth it doesn't keep their genealogy it focuses on the genealogy of uh the shemites after a certain point so the horites even though they don't have a genealogy in the bible it's possible that they came from japheth or ham and we're gonna sh i'm gonna show you some evidence that point to that to the to the fact that they may have come from japheth and not from the line of ham and so we're going to continue with the horites so right here uh we have the horites mentioned uh, genesis 14 6 the horites in their mount seir this is before the edomites got there the horites inhabited mount seir and we're going to see right here the horite 2752 horites 2752 right here it says um inhabitant of edom also the name of an edomite also the name of a Simeonite. so that's later on in the bible this is this is later on so don't worry about that part it says um, basically the same thing right here. But when we get to the exhaustive concordance part, they are called the cave dwellers or troglodytes or aboriginal Idumeans. So if you know what that word aboriginal means, it means they were first. They were in the Idumea or Edom first, uh, Mount Seir first before the Edomites. So they're referred to as the cave dwellers or the troglodyte. So what is a troglodyte? A noun, a person who lived in a cave, a hermit, a person who is regarded as being deliberately ignorant or old fashioned. So that's more of an insult uh, when you call somebody a troglodyte. It means they're ignorant or old fashioned. Um, but prehistoric times, a person who lived in a cave. What would be a person who lived in a cave? They would be a caveman. So again, in the title, I mentioned Bigfoot, caveman and Medusa. I showed you Medusa, I showed you Bigfoot. So now I'm showing you the cavemen in the Bible. Uh, You'll see these teachers trying to figure out where cavemen fit into the um, archaeological record. So I'm about to show you using the Bible where cavemen fit in. The Horites are cavemen. This is answer in Gen Answers in Genesis or Answers Magazine. Um, and they put out a special feature, finding a home for cavemen. Who were they? When did they live? How are they different? So, yeah. And then they're over here. They're talking about gl plus glow in the dark sea creatures. It's kind of interesting. The flood smoking gun. So I don't know when this is, when was this published? Uh, I can't see the date on here. Anyway, I just grabbed this picture. So you see the people interested in cavemen because they're like, well, science says cavemen existed. Where do they fit? I have some issues with carbon dating and uh, radiometric, or is it radiometric data, radio carbon dating? Um, it's, they have a bunch of different dating, a couple different dating processes, not a bunch, a couple different dating processes. But there are some issues with carbon dating. And I point those out in my book as the days of Noah were. Now, Right here, we're going to see what happens to the Horites or the Horim and their, their variations of that name. So we're going to start from verse 9, Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 9. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will not give thee their land for possession, because I have given R unto the children of Lot for a possession. Uh, I talked about this, that some people in the camps wrongfully teach that the Israelites conquered the Moabites and they started calling themselves Moabites and therefore um, Ruth was an Israelite and that's not true. Uh, go watch my video, The Gospel of Ruth, Did, Did Christ Die for All Mankind Part 2. So the, the Moabites have a possession in the land and he said, don't bother them, don't distress them. It says the Emims dwelt there in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. So we see these Bigfoot, these giants, we have confirmation that they are tall and it says people great and many and tall as the Anakims. We've seen that they're associated with the bugbear. We've seen how the bugbear was drawn. We've seen the modern day depiction of Bigfoot. Hopefully you're starting to get some understanding as to why in Numbers 13, 33, when they go in and see the giants in the land, they are scared. All this stuff is in the cavemen. You have a uh, <laughs> giant Bigfoot like population in there too. So you have a lot of stuff in there. They didn't want to go fight. Um, it says, which, all, let's see, tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. The Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, 
But the children of Esau succeeded them or came after them when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. So the, the Edomites or Esau went in there and they conquered the cavemen. And so Esau pushed the cavemen out of Canaan. Now, this is going to be important because later on, the Bible is going to mention that he drove out the Gentiles from the face of Israel in Canaan. And yet we still see the, the lineage of Ham. The Canaanites are there. They live among them. They mix with them. But he says, I drove out the Gentiles from before you. Now, there was no split between the northern kingdom and Judah yet. So he wasn't talking about uh, the northern kingdom for those who still believe the Gentiles are the northern kingdom. We're going to get there. When we talk about the Gentile study. The Gentiles are Japheth. He drove out Japheth's people from the land of Canaan. We're going to see that later on, too, in the book of Judges, when Herosheth of the Gentiles gets shut down. So there's a lot of evidence that Japheth's lineage was trying to settle in portions of Canaan and they got pushed out of Canaan by the wars. So the Horims or the Horites, um, they are, they were replaced by Esau. So the cavemen in Canaan were defeated. So over here, now I told you I was gonna give you some evidence that they are probably from the line of Japheth. What is the teaching on Japheth? I went through this in addressing the evidence. The teaching on Japheth is that Europeans descended from Japheth. This is the, the um, common Christian teaching that Semitic people descended from Shem and that um, Africans or black people descended from Ham. This is the common teaching. Once you lock yourself into that teaching, if you say, that's what I believe, then you're kind of stuck with the fact that Hamites and Shemites mixed. So you can't get around Israelites being black. It's impossible. And I break that down in addressing the evidence. And I show you all the times they mixed throughout the Bible, especially in the book of Judges, where it says they were all mixing with each other. And Japheth was not included in this mixing. They weren't mixing with Japheth. So now let me show you why the Horites, I believe, may have been descendants of Japheth. Uh, we skipped title king of nations, but as I pointed out, um, he was king of the Gentiles who are associated with Japheth. And later on, archeology span is going to connect him to Gutium or the Gutium people. If you want to track that down, we will probably come back to the Gushin. Well, we definitely will come back to the Gushin or Gutium people, uh, when we do the Gentile study, but they are described as blonde hair, blue eyed and white skinned. Now here are the Horites. Now, I, that's not my description, so don't hit me up later on saying I'm a racist for pointing to you to what other white people said. Other white people called him a white person. I didn't call him a white person. I just pointed out the study. And right here again, I'm about to point out the fact that another white person calls the whole rights white people. So this right here um, is A.H. Sace. So if you have a problem with what's being said right now, take it to him. Don't call me a racist for pointing out his, his article. This is from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, which consists of... Um, I believe it's a little over 200 um, authors that they included 200 uh, what they call Bible scholars and professors and all these other people. They included this, not me, not Dante. This is not my book. Go take it up with them. If you have a problem with what they say about the Horites. So now this is why I said also, I don't believe the Horites are Nephilim. I believe the Horites are descendants of Japheth, which is why we do not have a genealogy for them, which is why they are described the way they are about to be described. And which is why they get forced out of Canaan to tie into context, I drove out the Gentiles from before you. So right here, denoted the inhabitants of Mount Seir before its occupation by the Edomites. Seir is accordingly called Horite in Genesis 36, 20 and 30, where a list of his descendants is given, who afterward mixed with the invading Edomites. Esau called himself married, Esau himself married the daughter of the Horite chieftain Anna where Hivite must be corrected into Horite. So we're going to, we're going to talk about that too. Um, a lot of you believe Esau is the white man and we're going to see evidence that not only they mixed. However, we're going to see that Esau also mixed with Hamites. So it's, it's hard to say Esau is the white man. It's, it's hard to just distinguish and say Esau is the white man because this is why I'm very careful when I deal with the Esau subject, because we see Esau mixing with bunches of people. Esau is going to mix with some Shemites. Esau is going to mix with some, uh, lineage of Japheth and they're going to mix with the lineage, lineage of Ham. So it's hard to distinguish one race of people as Esau. So anyway, afterward mixed with the invading Edomites, Esau himself married the daughter of the Horite chieftain Anna, where Hivite must be corrected into Horite. The Horites, now this is this guy's opinion. Again, this is not scripture. This is this guy's opinion. The Horites in their Mount Seir were among the nations defeated by the army of Shedelah Omar in the age of Abraham. 
The Hebrew Horitic, however, is the car of the Egyptian inscriptions. Yeah, so if you go digging into the Horites, you will find a reference to car, K H A R people, and the Egyptians refer to them as that. A name given to the whole southern Palestine and Edom, as well as the adjacent sea. In accordance with this, we find in the Old Testament also traces of the existence of the Horites in other parts of the country besides Mount Seir. In Genesis 34 2, Joshua 9 7, the Septuagint more correctly reads Horite instead of Hivite for the inhabitants of Shechem and Gibeon. What happened to Shechem and Gibeon? If you know the story of Shechem, you know that Shechem was the one who, the king of the city who raped Abraham's daughter Dinah, and then Levi and Reuben went and killed them all, the whole city of them. So you have these people uh, in the Old Testament. Again, he says, I drove out the Gentiles from before you. So if you don't know where Shechem comes from, and there's a reason Shechem may not have a genealogy is because he was probably associated with these people. All right. So the, um, right here, uh, Southern Palestine is Edom of uh, the whole rights in other parts of the country besides Mount Seir. Um, more correctly, where is that? Okay. The Hivite for the inhabitants of Shechem and Gibeon and Caleb is said to be the son of her, the firstborn of Ephratah or Bethlehem. Hor or Horite has sometimes been explained to mean cave dweller. It more probably, however, denotes the white race. The Horites were Semites, which nothing in the Bible indicates that, as consequently are distinguished in Deuteronomy 2.12 from the tall race of Rephaim. So they are distinguished in Deuteronomy 2.12 from the Rephaim. It does not say they are Semites. Not once. We don't have a genealogy for them. We know that they are there and we know that they were killed off, driven out. The, the white cave dwellers. I didn't say this. He says this is right here. We saw the word means cave dweller in, um, in Hebrew. He's saying it probably, it probably, he doesn't know for sure denotes the white race. He thinks they're white people. He goes on to say, he also thinks they're Semites, which he's wrong because we know that they are not Semites because they would have been given a genealogy. But again, they are killed off and replaced by the Edomites. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing part of history or part of scripture explained where he says he drove out the Gentiles from before <clears throat> the face of Israel. And if you go with the, the, the traditional church thinking of that, uh, Europeans came from Japheth or the white race came from Japheth, then it explains why the whole rims are kicked out. It explains why, um, Shechem is wiped out completely after they raped Dinah, uh, or after the King rapes Dinah. It explains why Herosheth of the Gentiles is conquered and all these groups of people are pushed out of the promised land. But the Hamites remain, even though the Bible says he drove out the Gentiles. There, there are three different groups of people were being talked about here. The Hamites descended of Ham, the Shemites descended of Shem, and the Gentiles descended of Japheth. So let's talk about the end of the Horims. And this is uh, Deuteronomy 2. And we see this right here. Um, Right here, Deuteronomy two twenty two, as he did to the as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horims from the Horims from before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. So, what's interesting about this in Deuteronomy two twenty two, uh, we're gonna skip all this stuff. We see the names again. We're gonna see names of the giants, the Ammonites, the um, Zam, not the Ammonites, the Zamzumims, the Anakims. Um, but notice what he says about. We'll start at verse 21. We'll read this again. A people great and many and tall as the Anakims. That's reference to the Zamzumims. But the Lord destroyed them before, destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. He's talking about Israel. Said, as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horims from before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. So the Horims were destroyed from before Esau. Why is the Lord helping Esau to get rid of the Horims? Because he wanted Japheth out of that land. That is not Japheth's land. He drove Japheth out of that land. He did not drive out the Hamites or the Semites. He drove out Japheth. Japheth is not supposed to be in Israel. J that is not their land. That was the land of Ham. We're going to come back to that later on. So the Amorites. The Amorites are giants. Um, 
we see here that they, what we saw in Genesis where, oh, actually right here is, is all in the same verse. So right here, they come down and they kill the Amorites. Let's see. Did I get it all up here? I don't know what the hell is our slime pits. Okay, here we go right here. This is where we're going to pick up at. So after they come and slaughter these people, here we go right here. This is where we pick up at. And they return and came to Enmispat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Malachites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hezanzan Tamar. Again, I butcher all these words. I know I'm well aware. Don't send me messages saying it's pronounced like this or like that. It's probably not going to happen. And there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the Vale of Siddim. So now the, the Nephilim tribes and the cavemen are being attacked or the, the Bigfoot and the cavemen are out there being attacked along with the Rephaim who are the walking dead or the zombies, which again, we're going to come to later. So hopefully you guys get what's going on right there. People, why is the zombie apocalypse so popular right now as the days of Lot were? I'm going to show you guys where the ref I am are referred to as zombies, basically. As the days of Lot were, why is Bigfoot so popular? Why are ancient aliens so popular? Why is Bigfoot tied to aliens? Why are there cavemen? Like, there's a lot of stuff going on in this story. So it almost sounds like ridiculous when you keep, when you really realize what's going on, it almost sounds like crazy. So you have the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah come out with their other people. And verse 19 uh, they do battle in the uh, veil says with Shetel Omar, the king of Elam and with title king of nations and Amraphel, king of Shinar and Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings with five. And the veil of Siddam was full of slime pits and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain. So Sodom and Gomorrah just lost their kings are dead and they are fleeing to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Sodom and all their victuals and went their way. So now they're being looted and they took lot. Abraham's brother's son and dwelt in Sodom and his goods who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So Lot has been kidnapped and there came one that escaped and told Abraham the Hebrew. Now it's differentiating. I'm just letting you know to Abraham the Hebrew for he dwelt in the plain of Mamar the Amorite. We're talking about the Amorites right now, right? So the Amorites got attacked. Now some survivors of the Amorites, they run directly to um, Abraham and it says this the um he dwelt in the plain of Mamar the Amorite. So if you guys have heard the name Mamar come up and you say, Oh, well, dwell, Abraham dwelt in the plain of Mamar, Mamar is an Amorite. They dwelt in the plain of Mamar the Amorite, brother of Eschol and brother of Anar, and these were confederate with Abraham. This is an alliance. Abraham has an alliance with the Amorites. I'm about to show you why this is so important. So Sodom and Gomorrah are aligned with the Amorites. And Abraham is aligned with the Amorites, probably for protection, but Abraham has a small military with him. We're about to see some of this stuff happen. So in Numbers 13, 33, right, we'll, we'll come up with the Numbers 13 uh, up here um, before we get into there, just, just so you understand who the Amorites are. Uh, we're going to start in Numbers 13, 28 and read through 33. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. This is the report they get from Numbers 13.33. We're going to come back to this as we continue this study um, in a different part. But he said, moreover, that means more importantly, he said, the people there are strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. But more importantly, we saw the children of Anak. And the Amalekites dwell in the land to the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So he's saying we saw the children of Anak there. He said, in addition to Anak, there's all these other tribes. But more importantly, Anak, the children of Anak are there. He says, and Caleb stilled the people from people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. They were confident. Now you'll see the sons of Anak. Now let me preface this because we're not going to get into it right now. But there are only a, three sons of Anak, I believe it was. Three sons of Anak plus Anak. There are four. And there are over a million Israelites. Not all of them are going to go to war. But they way outnumber them. And those four have them shook. Ten out of the twelve spies, two shook to go in. And Caleb still the people, we read that. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. 
And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it out is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. Cannibalistic giants. That land is full of giant cannibals. It says, and there we saw the giants. Uh, it says Nephilim in Hebrew. We're coming back to that. The sons of Anak, which come of the giants. Now notice, the people are bigger than them, stronger than them, but they are very specific. They call the sons of Anak the Nephilim. We, there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. So we saw the sons of the Nephilim, which come of the Nephilim, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. They're giving you a comparison, a simile. I covered similes in um, addressing the evidence. I believe it was addressing the evidence. I covered the use of similes in the Bible. They're comparing themselves to grasshoppers. So this right here is why they were scared. The son of Anak. And we're going to get into this. I don't want to get too sidetracked with that. So here, the Amorites, um, they are named. Um, the Amorites right here. The Amorites dwell in the mountains. Now, I want to point that out. The, Amor the Amorites dwell in the mountains. Who was confederate with the Amorites? Sodom and Gomorrah. Where'd they, where'd they flee to when they um, lost the battle? They fled into the mountains. And one of the survivors, the brother of uh, Mamar the Amorite, came to Abraham and said they kidnapped your brother. Over here in Amos, uh, chapter 2-9, we're going to find out that the Amorites were giants. Amos 2-9-10. Or just two nine. We only need to read ten. You can go read this. Read this whole chapter on your own. Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. So the Amorites are giants. It says they're as tall as the oaks and strong as the cedars. Now, they are aligned with Sodom and Gomorrah. In those cities, they're aligned with Abraham. Again, Abraham's alliance was probably strategic militarily. You can't just be out there by yourself where there's giants and all kind of other strange creatures roaming around and you got no protection. So here's what's going to happen. Angel human relations. Sodom, after, they well, after Sodom loses and Lot is kidnapped, Abraham goes in with 300 of his trained soldiers. He also goes in with um, the three hybrid brothers, Aner, Eskal, and Mamar and their people and they go in and get lot out because of course the Amorites won't revenge because they were just attacked and they are confederate with Abraham and now Abraham has a dog in the fight his nephew has been kidnapped with all of his family his nephew his nieces probably lots wife everybody so Abraham now has takes his his uh, three I think it was 318 trained men uh, might have been 218 but I'm pretty sure it's 318 trained men and they go in there and they get lot out along with the Amorites who probably want some get back for what just happened. So hopefully you're starting to see what's going on. So you have the human angel, human relations going on in this time a lot. There's a strategic alliance between the Nephilim and Abraham. There's a strategic alliance between uh, Sodom and them, but none of this stuff helps except it helps Abraham. So we read in Jude how the angels were going after hetero sarks, uh, strange flesh. So we're not going to get too much into that. That was Jude one seven. Um, it compares the sin of the angels to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. It links the um, angels in Genesis. Are in it, it links the angels of Noah's time to the angels of Sodom and Gomorrah, and says their sin was going after strange flesh. And we talked about First Corinthians fifteen, where it says all flesh is not the same flesh, and it gives you a breakdown of the difference between celestial flesh and terrestrial flesh. So we're going to keep moving past that. But let's get to the ruin of Sodom. So. After these events happen, the men pursue the angels and they say, let us rape your angels and let me. Yeah. OK, so we're not going to go into that. So, yeah, the men are like, let us rape these angels. Let us rape those men that came to you. Lot says, no, you can have my daughters. And they say, no, we don't want your daughters. We want those men. And if you don't give us the men, we'll rape you. So there's a lot going on right there. Right. What amazes me is after the men, the, the angels blind all the men in the city. What's interesting about this whole scenario, and I, I don't think I added this in here, is that it wasn't just the men of the city. We have this this um, idea that only the men of the city came out. If you read it, the men were leading the charge and then all the people of the city came out. The women were there, too. It says the men were leading it and then all the people come and surround Lot's house. So after they blind these people, they stay in there till morning. 
I don't know if they slept. Lot probably didn't sleep not one bit that night. I don't think anybody in the house probably slept that night at all because these people are outside the door, but they've been blinded, so they can't find the house. So first thing in the morning, this is Genesis 19, uh, verses 12 through 16, where I'm coming from. First thing in the morning, um, I'm going to read this here. The angels it says, and the men said unto Lot, hast thou any, hast thou here any besides son in law, uh, probably thy son in law and thy sons and thy daughters and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters and said, up, get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Now that word mocked isn't the same as we think of it. it uh, if you go pull it up on um, Bible Hub, it actually means one who he seemed like one who was telling a joke like he was joking like he was kidding around like hey god's about to destroy the place let's go so that he would get them to get up and panic and then be like ha, i tricked you i was just making fun of you that type of joke so they didn't want to fall for it so they ignored his warning and when the morning arose then the angels hastened lot saying arise take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here lest thou be consumed in the nick the iniquity of the city and while he lingered now, notice Lot is lingering. He doesn't want to leave while he lingered. The men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters and the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. So they physically had to remove Lot from Sodom. <clears throat> We'll come back to this. So right here, it says they're going to destroy the city. Seventy eight. Forty three. We've encountered this word before 7843. We encountered it in the days of Noah in Genesis six for the, the all flesh have become corrupted. The earth was corrupt 7843. So they said, we're going to destroy this place. Remember 7843 Shekoth. I think the use of the word Shekoth is intentional because they're going to ruin, go to ruin, waste, destroy, wreak destruction. They're going to devastate this place. They're going to completely wipe out this place. The same thing that the angels had done to all flesh in Noah's time by tampering with it. They had completely destroyed it. They made it unsalvageable. And so God had to take what little what was left, the eight humans and the two by two animals and put them on the ark to preserve it. So what they're going to do here, the angels are going to make Sodom unsalvageable. And we're going to see references to that later on in the Bible. So we have um, the Amorites who live in the mountains. Remember, the Amorites are Nephilim that live in the mountains. Now, the Amorites don't know Lot personally. And remember, there's a war. Everything's happened. Everything's in devastation. The Amorites are a lot of these giant tribes are destroyed. Uh, their stuff was probably taken because that's what happens when you get looted and destroyed or you get destroyed. They loot. They take stuff off. They carry people, food, supplies, weapons, everything, animals, all of that stuff. So now what you have is giants in the mountains that have just been destroyed and they're probably low on resources and everything else. All this happens pretty quickly. It says um, Genesis 19. Now we're going to have some interesting uh, turn of events here. And it came to pass this is 1917 through 23. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Now everybody pays attention to the story because Lot's wife, um, gets turned to salt, but they skip all the other stuff. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so my Lord. So now a lot has been physically removed and they say run into the mountains. And he's like, no, <laughs> he's like, I'm not going there. This is why he says, behold, now thy servant have found grace in thy sight. And thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil overtake me or that will take me. And I die um, more correctly overtake me. So he's worried about something in the mountains overtaking him. And he refers to it as evil in the mountains. Why is Lot worried about evil in the mountains? Because once we have the context and we understand, understand that the Amorites are in the mountains, they are mountain dwelling giants that eat people. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. 
And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. So wait, there's a city that was going to be overthrown and a lot said, hey, let me go there. And he said, I won't destroy it because you are going there. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar, and the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Remember, the angel snatched him out in the morning, and Lot made it to Zoar by the time the sun was up, probably midday. And remember, the destruction of Sodom rained down in a day. So let's keep going. Now, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. So he's utterly destroying the city. But his wife looked back a lot from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld. And lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. So Abraham got up first thing in the morning to see if the city's still there. He sees smoke. Remember him and Lot split ways. And he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward the land of the plain. Beheld, uh, lo, smoke of the country went up as smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham. And sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. Remember Abraham, when he's asking if God would spare the cities, he talked God from he talked God down from 50 to 10. God was going to spare these people and they weren't Israelites. He was going to spare these people that he went from 50 to 10. He said, I'll spare it if it's 10. He doesn't find 10. Not once did Abraham ask for Lot to be spared. But what happened? It said God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Abraham did not once mention his nephew. It says, and Lot went up out of Zoar. Now notice this, Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. He didn't want to go to the mountains because he thought someone evil would overtake him. Then he saw the destruction of the cities. He said, you know what? I'm probably safe from the mountains and in this city. Because he saw what God did to the cities and nothing survived. So Lot decided when at first he didn't want to take his chances in the mountain because some evil was up there. He said, whatever this is. I'd rather deal with the evil that's going on in the mountains than to be in this city when God gets ready to overthrow it because he might not come get me out again. That's probably his line of thinking. I don't know that for sure, but he's probably thinking God might not come get me out again. So let me get out of the city and get to the mountains. I'll take my chances with the uh, giant man eating Nephilim. It says, and Lot went up to Zoar and dwelt in the mountain and his two daughters with him for he feared to dwell in Zoar and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. So he went and lived in a cave in a mountain versus living in the city. What does God tell us to do regarding Babylon? Come out of her, my people. What did Lot do? He got out of the city and he ran to the cave. So we're going to see a lot of connections. I'm trying not to get too deep in this stuff, get ahead of myself. So some of this stuff might be a stretch that I'm about to show you. And again, chew the meat, spit out the bones. Might be a stretch, but I'm going to show you what I see anyway. And hopefully the reason I show you guys this stuff is so hopefully somebody will take this research and not just stop at it, but go do some digging and take it further than I have done it. I feel like it's kind of like passing the uh, baton in a, in a, um, a marathon race because I picked it up a lot of, I picked up a lot of the stuff from where Chuck Missler left off. And I feel like I'm taking a, a lot further further than some of the places he went with it so now i'm hoping somebody will take my research and then go even further than that and then share it so we can start putting all this stuff together so let's talk about mental health most of you recognize charlemagne the god he talks about mental health he has his book out shook one it's about mental health but why does mental health seem to be so popular and again it might be a stretch but i'm gonna show you some things that I think point to why the mental health situation is so popular right now because it's connected to the days a lot. Look what happened a lot. He meets angels. When we see people meet angels in the Bible, they are traumatized to the point that they can't stand up. They lose the ability to stand. This is how shook they get. And, and you see this throughout the Bible. It's consistent. They get scared. The people of the city wanted to rape his guest. So now Lot has gone through that emotional trauma of everybody in the city, not just the men. The men were leading the pack and then all the people of the city came out and they're beating at his door saying, give us your guest, give us your guest. And he goes out and says, do not this evil. He says, don't do this. 
So they get mad at him and he, he offers the, his two daughters. So now he has not only is he, he understands the guests are special, they're angels. He understands exactly who they are. So these people are trying to rape God's servants. And then he offers his two daughters in place because he's like, wait a minute, it's better that this happen than I play a part in this happening right here to these these angels knowing full well who sent these angels so now the people's like we don't want the daughters we're going to rape you and do you worse than we were going to do them and so they start to attack him so this is all mental trauma like if somebody was to go through this in real life they would need a therapist it's not done yet so then the angels blind everyone so now lot is a personal witness to supernatural power he hasn't time to unpack all that had time to unpack all this stuff because remember the next morning we're gonna see this he's forced to leave his home everything he knows because he's what do you say he's taking his time he's tarrying and the angels forcefully remove him and his family they gave him a chance to leave they told him the night before take everything out of your house in the morning god is going to destroy this place and lot takes his time because he doesn't want to leave so now he's forced from everything he's know and everything he's known and as he's escaping as well as they set him outside they say go flee into the mountains where the uh, man-eating giants live and he's like no i can't do that like something's gonna something's gonna kill me if i go do that so then his wife gets turned to salt as they're fleeing so now he's lost his sons-in-law everybody in the city he knows remember lot had herdsmen and all kind of wealth all those people are probably dead too all lots livelihood is gone now his wife is gone and he's fleeing for his life away from his homeland it's not really his homeland but you know where he's made home at he's fleeing because that's being turned into a wasteland by fire and brimstone raining down from god then his daughters get him so drunk that they get him pregnant, that he gets them pregnant. This is what Lot is going through. And again, I think it points to the fact that there would be mental health issues. There's all kind of craziness is going on. But look at Deuteronomy 28, 65. He said, and among these nations, thou shalt have no ease. Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. Do you think that's what Lot may have gone through? I think it's possible that what Lot went through may be connected to the curses in Deuteronomy 28 as a sign, not because Lot was under a curse, but just as an example, because remember, we read in the book of Jude, uh, book of Peter, these are set forth for examples. The angels, Lot's time, Noah's time, all this stuff going on. So Lot, if we're ever going to talk about mental trauma, somebody in the Bible that somebody in the Bible that is a survivor of mental trauma, it would be Lot out of all people as we can see lot went through more than almost anybody mentally now even to to think of it from a position of um we're gonna come back to that but we know lot was righteous and we're gonna see right here lot was righteous lot and mental health so lot is kind of like job in a sense but all this stuff happened a lot in a single day uh we get right here second peter uh, two four through nine for if god spared not the angels of sin but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness but reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world but saved noah the eighth person a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of sodom and gomorrah into ashes condemned them with an overthrow making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly there's the word example and delivered just lot here we go vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver, deliver the ungodly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, one of the things I did not touch upon here is that when Abraham is negotiating with the Lord, he says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? In context, he says, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? Shall not, he said, far be it from you to do this. Shall not the judge of the earth do right? So Abraham knew it was going to be wrong for God to destroy the righteous and the wicked together. Now, see, we're going to come back to this when we talk about the concept of the rapture. And I know people are like, well, the rapture isn't in the Bible. Those are people that play semantics. The concept of the rapture is in the Bible. 
I don't care about the exact word. That's semantic stuff. God is not bound by human language. So if you want to call it the rapture and say the rapture is not in the Bible, fine. Call it the rapture. That's in the Latin Vulgate or call it the harp, um, the harpazo. That's in the Septuagint. You can call it whatever you want to. People play these semantics games and say, well, this word wasn't there in this language. And yet they talk to you in English, even though none of the English words were there. I just want to point out the, the hypocrisy of that. But there are elements in there in that the angels could not destroy anything. Who comes at the end times and separates the wheat from the chaff, the, the, the um, separates the people out, the sheep from the goats, whatever metaphor you want to use. The angels, the angels come harvest and the godly are separated from the ungodly. The, the ones that knew him are separated from the ones that don't know him. And what happens is when God goes down to see what's happening with Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham says, will you spare for 10? He doesn't find 10. He delivers the righteous anyway. He doesn't spare the whole city, but he delivers the righteous from out of the city and he gives them a place of refuge. Zoar and Zoar is going to stand for a lot longer. We're going to encounter Zoar throughout the old Testament, but just remember that Zoar Zoar was an insignificant city. I'm going to come back to that. I don't want to keep, touching on that just yet just yet so it might be a stretch we're gonna come back to Astaroth Astaroth Astarte Anana we came up here we talked about Anana and one of the references we talked about Anana being before the flood and married to uh, Tamas the Muzi, the shepherd but here's another interesting thing I wanted to touch on she was originally worshipped in Sumer and was later worshipped by the Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians under the name Ishtar. She was known as the Queen of Heaven and was the patron goddess of the Iana Temple in the city of Uruk, or Iraq, which was her main cult center. She was associated with the planet Venus, and her most prominent symbols included the lion and the pointed and the eight-pointed star. Her husband was the god Demuzid, later known as Tammuz. So we're going to stop there, right? So she's known as the queen of heaven. We know she's associated with Tammuz, who's listed as a pre-flood lowercase g god king who was dragged down to the underworld after he got caught sleeping with women and she snitched on him. So all this stuff is consistent with what we know. But we see this term queen of heaven. Remember, Astaroth was worshipped by the Rephaim in the days of Lot. She's associated with Astarte. Astarte is associated with Anana. All of this stuff comes full circle. And now we see that she's called the queen of heaven. And we come back to the Bible and we see the queen of heaven mentioned in the Bible. This female entity who many people say doesn't exist because there's no such thing as female entities in the Bible. And I've shown you several times that they are wrong. I, I gave you a list of them and we're going to get further into them when we get into the angels. But the queen of heaven is mentioned. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women need their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods lowercase g and that they may provoke me to anger this is in jeremiah 7 18 jeremiah 44 17 18 and 19 reads like this but we will certainly do so whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth these they're talking to the prophet jeremiah in regards to him trying to get them to stop doing this to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done we and our fathers our kings and our princes in the cities of judah and in the streets of jerusalem and then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil <coughs> they believe that because remember this is the goddess of fertility don't forget this the queen of heaven is um one of the fertility goddesses worshipped but we see that she has been passed down throughout history under various names but it's linked to the same deity that was existing pre-flood according to the sumerians not the Samaritans, just so you don't confuse the two. Verse 18, but since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. Remember, she's fertility goddess. That, that implies the crops, not just sex. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Now he's talking to the women. Now remember, before we mentioned that the women were weeping for Tammuz. So the men are participating in this too. 
the worship of the queen of heaven. Now, there's a reason I'm mentioning this, because this is who the, the, the giants were worshiping in the time of Lot. Didn't Christ say likewise as the days of Lot were? His coming is going to be like that. So you Google queen of heaven. What do you get? Queen of heaven is a title given to Mary, mother of Jesus, by Christians, mainly of the Catholic Church. And to a lesser extent in Anglicanism and Lutheranism and Eastern Eastern Orthodoxy. Interesting that we come into a time where there are a large group of people still worshiping Mary as the queen of heaven. And we see the queen of heaven is linked to the days of Lot. I personally don't believe any of this stuff is coincidence. I believe that all of this stuff is specifically and strategically placed in the Bible for us to go looking for it. And yet we've had uh, different control systems put in place. I don't believe that all of this stuff is conspiracy to hide it from us. I believe that a lot of stuff, people just say, don't do it. And we don't do it. People say, don't look outside the Bible. Don't look in any other books. Don't use these books. Don't look at the history. This is mythology. Don't believe this. This is fake. They lied. They're worshiping idols. We get all these reasons not to look. And then when we go looking, we start finding interesting stuff that clarifies things in the Bible that don't make sense. So now we have a whole bunch of stuff that's tied together. So now we're going to come back to something else. Let's talk about the insignificance. Salvation by grace. So Noah found grace. Christ pointed to the time of Noah. Noah found grace and he was saved and baptized via the flood. We talked about that reference that the flood becomes a symbol of baptism. And so now we have another situation of somebody being saved by grace, not just three people, but a bunch of people. So right here in the um, story of Sodom and Moriah begins, listen to what he says to about Abraham. It says Genesis 18, 20 it says and Abraham, I'm sorry. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. It's interesting that God comes down to personally see what's going on. We find this in Genesis chapter. Um, oh, was it 11? The Tower of Babel. When he goes down to see what's going on with mankind, he doesn't just sit where he is and cast judgment. He said, let me go down and see this in person for myself so I can know what's going on. Because remember, he's the judge of all the earth. And if, a, if he's a righteous judge, he's going to come judge righteously. Because he it said the cry of it. So he heard he heard what was going on. He's not going on hearsay. So now he wants to come be an eyewitness. By the mouth of two or three things shall the matter be established. How many come to Abraham? We're going to see three. And then we're going to see two to go on to Sodom. It says, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. So the Lord stays with Abraham. The other two, the angels go on towards Sodom. And we're going to see a sundown happens at Sodom. We're not going to see, but sundown happened at Sodom. Um, because Lot was waiting for them. He said, don't tarry in the streets all night. So this journey is going to take them almost a full day to get from where Abraham is to Sodom to get to Lot. It says the men turned their faces um, and from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord and Abraham drew near and said, "Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked. This is an important question. Peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner. He's saying, please don't do this to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Abraham is having a crisis of faith, kind of. Because he understands that God is the righteous judge. And he's like, wait a minute, if you're righteous, how can you go destroy all these people? If there's still righteous people there, why are you going to destroy them with the wicked? And he's saying, Will you spare the whole city? Abraham wants the whole city to be spared. He probably understands that his, his, he does understand that his nephew's there. Not probably. He understands his nephew's there, but he doesn't ask specifically about his nephew. He asks about the city and he says, and the Lord said, if I find in Sodom, 50 righteous within a the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. This is important because Abraham talks him down to 10 people and people say, well, God destroyed Sodom because of homosexuality. Well, they didn't suddenly become homosexuals because the angels walked into their city. 
It means all this stuff was going on when God was talking to Abraham because he said the cry is great. Now I'm going to see if, if what they say is going on is going on. And he said, I will spare the whole city if there's only 50 righteous people there. So he didn't destroy this city because of homosexuality. And later on, we do an actual study on, on uh, Sodom. Sodom's going to come up later throughout. But I'll do an actual study on, on Sodom and Gomorrah, the sins specifically. We're going to see. Actually, matter of fact, I'm going to kick off part three with the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. But we're going to see that the sins listed, while they include homosexuality, they include a whole lot of other stuff that is more common way more common that a lot more people do and yet they don't name that as one of the reasons why sodom is destroyed and as i pointed out before they don't name the reason of humans going after angelic flesh as a reason but god allows abraham to talk him down to 10 and not only that abraham controls the whole conversation if you pay attention to the whole conversation in genesis 18 Abraham is the one who keeps changing the terms and God says, okay, I'll spare it. I'll spare it. I'll spare it until he gets down to 10. But when he goes in there, he doesn't find 10. He finds Lot and his two daughters because remember the wife gets turned to salt. So she, she didn't make it only Lot and his two daughters. Three people were spared out of all these cities. They couldn't find 10 people. Second Peter, what'd he say? So right here, Abraham gives us some insight. He says, Far be it from thee to do after this manner. Far, um, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So these are not Israelites for those that believe in Israelite only salvation. Right here we see that and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. We know Lot and his daughters. It says for that righteous man. So who did he deliver? He delivered the righteous. Because he's not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. Even though Lot was not an Israelite. Lot was a Shemite, but he's not an Israelite. And not only did he spare Lot. For that righteous man dwelling among them. Seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So Lot gets spared. His daughters get spared. But let's take it back over here. What happens? Why did he spare Lot? Take it back to Genesis 19. Because remember as the days of Lot were. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. And as thou hast magnified thy mercy which thou sh showed unto me in saving my life this is, the, this is the most important part right here salvation by grace we see grace, mercy and salvation by grace that is another sign just like Noah we saw Noah found grace he s was saved by grace we have Lot who is now saved by grace nobody's being saved by the law right here Everybody's being saved by grace and mercy. This is important to point out for all you people teaching that we got to keep the law in order to be saved. We see no examples that Christ pointed to. He said, look at the days of Noah. Look at the days of Lot. And we're going to come back and do two separate studies on the days of Noah and the days of Lot in context of salvation by grace, not the law. You can keep the law if you want to. Now, let me say this. I don't look at people who, who keep the law as bad because there's nothing bad about trying to keep the law to better yourself as a person. But if you're trying to keep the law to earn salvation, you are missing the entire point. But it doesn't stop there. Again, we see salvation by grace, but it isn't just extended to Lot. Because remember, Abraham said, will you spare everybody if you just find 10? He said, yes, I'll spare everybody if I find 10. So Lot, there's three. Lot and his two daughters that escape. Three people. But what happens? Lot escapes to Zoar. And we come down here. And he says, Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Because remember, it was uh, called Bella before. Now it's called Zoar. But that city was on the list to be destroyed. That's why he told him to go into the mountains. He was going to wipe out all the cities. Remember, Zoar was so insignificant that they didn't even name the king when they went up against the other five kings. So Zoar was on the list to be destroyed. But why was Zoar spared? Because God extended grace to Lot. And because God would not destroy the righteous with the wicked. And Zoar was a small, insignificant city. 
that they all were saved from the destruction because simply by Lot's presence, simply because Lot asked him not to destroy that city. Abraham almost succeeded in getting the city spared. He was seven short. Had he went down to three, maybe Sodom and Gomorrah would have lasted. But as we see, God is willing to spare. It tells us he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So I just want to point out that there are a lot of things going on in the days of Noah and the days of Lot, and we're not done. And remember, this study is about the Nephilim. This study isn't even about um, salvation or any of the other stuff I've touched upon. But it's so much stuff to unpack that you can't avoid going through a lot of these examples while you're on one subject. And we're going to come back to the days of not to the days of Lot and the days of Noah over and over and over again because they are blueprints. They are going to set the stage for a lot of other events throughout the Bible. The days of Noah, I mentioned the days of Noah will be important for understanding Exodus through 2 Samuel. The days of Lot are going to be important for understanding various other parts of the Bible. As I've showed you, Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and these other passages that reference back to the days of Lot. It's important to understanding why Bigfoot and ancient aliens are on TV right now. It's important to understanding why Mary is being worshipped as the queen of heaven. I mean, all of this stuff ties together. So coming up in this series, we've already touched on the uh, Nimrod Nephilim conspiracy. We pointed out Nimrod's not a Nephilim. We've touched on Sodom and Gomorrah and the giant allies. We're going to get into the promised land. I'm going to kick it off um, with Sodom and Gomorrah, as I said. But we're getting to giants in the promised land. Uh, we're going to get into David and Goliath, especially that part right there. Um, so the giants in the promised land is going to start from Joshua. We're going to start probably from the book of uh, Numbers and work our way through. Actually, probably the book of Deuteronomy and work our way. No, book of Numbers for sure. Book of Numbers and work our way through um, the book of Joshua. And we're going to get into David and Goliath later after that. We're going to definitely talk about the line like men of Moab. And then we're going to continue discussing the hard evidence for the existence of giants. So for those of you who have not grabbed your copy of As the Days of Noah Were, The Sons of God in the Coming Apocalypse, or Beyond Flesh and Blood, both of those are available on Amazon.com in paperback format and in Kindle. For those who want to support Patreon.com forward slash Dante Fortson or support via Cash App with cash tag BHITB, uh, the PayPal support link is in the description. And for those of you in the Super Chat, you can click the dollar sign um, during any premiere and support that way. And for those of you who don't have it financially, a share and a prayer, make sure you click that thumbs up button too. Make sure you subscribe to my channel because you don't want to miss part three. I'm going to keep tying some stuff together for you guys in part three. Um, also, click the notification bell. That's important, too. If you don't want to miss these when they come out, if you want to participate in the live chats with us during the premiere, make sure you click the notification bell so you don't miss the live chats. Turn on all notifications after you click that bell. Again, make sure you thumbs up. Make sure you share this if you like it. Um, with that said, until next time. I'm out.